Welcome to Hannity. And tonight, for the full hour, a, Demo a town hall with Democrat running for president. And coming up, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. will join us right here. We got a rowdy New York City crowd. Thanks for coming. We appreciate it. No topic is off the table. No question is off limits, that's for sure. Now, we definitely don't agree on everything, but that's, that's not my role here tonight. Uh, we're not going to shut down Robert F. Kennedy Jr. He's running for president. And I know there are other people in the media that have said they want to deplatform him and not even listen to him. I actually believe in freedom and freedom of speech and the freedom of the American people to hear things that they may disagree with and ascertain and determine for themselves whether they agree or don't agree. If it's a medical issue, my advice is go to your doctor, ask your doctor, consult with them, somebody that knows your medical history, your pre-existing conditions, comorbidities you might have, medicines you might be taking. So um, that's going to be up to you, the audience, and I put faith and tr trust and hope in all of you. Like many of his fellow Democrats and others in the media mob, make no mistake, they are right now furious with RFK Jr. They seem to loathe his stance on medical freedom and privacy. They are angry. He does not toe the party line on the war in Ukraine and former President Donald Trump. They can't seem to stand that Robert Kennedy Jr. is a free thinker with classic liberal principles. And today, well, today's Democratic Party is about compliance. It's about going along. It's about groupthink. Stepping out of line simply could be unacceptable for many, especially for a, quote, Kennedy. And tonight, for some reason, many Democrats, they have circled the wagons around an 80-year-old, cognitively impaired, frankly, morally bankrupt uh, career politician who has been credibly accused of plagiarism, bribery, public corruption from an outsider's perspective, perspective. I think even the Democratic Party can do a lot better. And my next guest agrees. That's why he is challenging Joe Biden for the Democratic nomination. New York City, let's give a warm welcome. Democratic candidate for president, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Have a seat. How are you? Very well. They're all here to see me. They didn't know. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, you have a lot of fans here. I, I guess my first question is an obvious one, but maybe, maybe we'll learn something. You're challenging a sitting U.S. president in your party. You have to have good reason to do so. Tell us what it is. Well, I... <clears throat> You know, I saw, first of all, thank you for having me, Sean. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. I saw, I saw a poll yesterday afternoon that said that in 1985, 85% <clears throat> of Americans were proud to be American. 85% of Americans between 18 and 30 years old. And a poll taken last week of people that same age, of Americans that same age, say that only 42% are proud to be American. I, um, I want my children to grow up as proud of this country as I was. And, you know, I grew up at a time when we believed with, with really good reason that this country was the greatest country in history, and that we were a moral authority around the world. Uh, that we were, in, and there was plenty of evidence for that. The world wanted our leadership. They knew the difference between leadership and bullying. But people all over the world looked to uh, the United States of America for leadership. Um, when my uncle was president, he lived up to that, uh, to that role. Um, and there is now more statues to him, uh, more, more boulevards named after him, more avenues, more universities in Africa and Asia and Latin America than any other president. And it evinced the, uh, you know, it, because he didn't focus on shooting people and on sending, he never sent a combat veteran abroad or a combat soldier abroad to die. He sent 16,000 military advisors to Vietnam and then awarded them all home one month before he died and they were allowed to participate in combat exercises. Some of them did. And, um, and instead he sent Peace Corps volunteers. 
He created the Alliance for Progress. He created USAID. He wanted to put America on the side of the poor all over the world and on the side of democracy, but not at the force of a gun. In this country, you know, I grew up at a time that's called, it was called the Great Prosperity, when we created the middle class, which was the greatest economic engine ever created, the American middle class, and it was the, it was the foundation stone of our democracy. A guy asked me, a, a New Yorker editor who interviewed me a couple of weeks ago, said to me, what qualifies you to be president? You've never been in Congress. You've never been a governor. You've never been in the Senate. And for me, that's probably the best qualification. Because... <laughs> And I'm not, I'm not saying anything bad about people. I think most people who are in public office are there because they want to be good citizens. They want to be good public servants. But the system nowadays tends to go up you. And, you know, to run for senator in this state, Sean, it costs $100 million. And that means that you have to spend most of your time jetting between Southampton and Palm Beach and Los Angeles and hang out with billionaires who are going to give you money. My job over the past 40 years has been suing government agencies for corruption. And, and, re and representing, representing people, 10,000 families in Smelter, West Virginia, who are poisoned by zinc from, uh, and lead from a, a DuPont uh, smel smelting facility. The six, a thousand families I'm now representing in Columbia and County, Pennsylvania, or Ohio, for the Norfolk Southern spill. Um, the the ten thousand families I represented in the Dupont case who were poisoned by PFAS and PFOAs, and the forty thousand people I represented in Monsanto, and I end up and fishermen who I've you know represented as you know my whole life on the Hudson and other places. And I end up seeing how people live, and I've seen the disintegration of the American dream and the American experience. I've seen um, not only the social and economic uh, deprivation that now exists in this country that's like what I saw in Latin America when I was a kid, and I never dreamed I'd see it in this country. 57% of Americans can't put their hands on $1,000 if they have an emergency. How scary is that? 35% of, our, our, of people in this country do not make enough money to pay for basic human needs for, for transportation, housing, and food. So they have to make choices every day. They have to listen to the baby crying in the, in the room next door and have to wonder whether that baby is $30 sick or $40 or $200 sick before they bring him to a hospital. They have to choose between heat and food, between medicine and food. My wife and I had this discussion. My wife grew up very, very poor. And until she you know, got a break by getting the job from Larry David on Curb Your Enthusiasm, she was living in poverty. By the way, she's great on that show. Thank she you. really is. Yeah. You like that show? Good show. And she said, she said to me, you know, the whole time I was, I was living paycheck to paycheck. And so, she so, said, by the way, so was I. Yeah. I can identify with that. And, you know, that is it's not fun. It's frightening. And she said, you know, that we were talking about how depression and mental illness rates and suicide rates have risen just dramatically in this country. And she said, well, being poor makes you depressed because you're scared all the time and you think there's something wrong with you. And, you know, this is not the America that well, I... Let me ask you, because I, I hear everything, I'm listening very closely to what you're saying, and you're saying that we can do better, and I agree with you. We have nearly, you know, over 60% of this country living paycheck to paycheck. The average American owes $54,000, $55,000 in debt. Uh, people are cashing in their pensions to get bare necessities, or they're putting stuff on credit cards at, you know, 22.5% interest rate. Now, I would argue that's part of the Biden economy. And, and, you know, the only difference where we, might, where we might separate here is whether or not you think it ought to be a government program. I think it's free market economies that inspire entrepreneurs and you have the freedom and the ability to bring goods and, and services to market versus, say, the government giving you your bare necessities. I mean... Yeah, of course. And, no, and nobody wants that. Nobody wants to live on the government dole. 
Um, but, uh, and it is, I mean, we don't have free market capitalism in this country. We have corporate crony capitalism. We have a, we have a, we have a, we have a system of, of cushy socialism for the super rich and this, this uh, brutal, a kind of brutal, savage, merciless capitalism for the poor. And it's all designed to strip mine the middle class of this country of all of their equity, all of their assets, and move it to the upper echelons. And, and you know, the COVID lockdowns were the final straw. COVID lockdowns, we created a billionaire a day, and this was Trump and Biden. Of 500 days of lockdowns, we created a billionaire a day. We moved $4 trillion from the American middle class to the super rich. We built, the people who came into the lockdown with 30, with a billion dollars increased their wealth on average by 30%. And you, and you know, we closed 3.3 million businesses. And so that- In retrospect, uh, and, and I give for a period of time in the early days, nobody knew what the hell they were dealing with. Let's be fair. But there came. Uh, I'm a, not going to be fair. I, that's all right, you fair. don't be fair. <laughs> no, in the early days, I'm talking about January 20, 2020, yeah, February. But, you know, those, people, early, those early days. Yeah, but people. Well, let, let me people, finish the question. Okay, go ahead. But then, you know, we, we got to a point, and this is where you and I will find some agreement. Everybody in this country, everybody in this room, were told things that turned out to be absolutely false. If you take the vaccine, you're never going to get COVID. You take the vaccine, you're not going to infect other people. Now, these are smart people. We're dealing with the virus, and viruses all mutate. And then it mutated into the Delta variant. And then they took away monoclonal antibody uh, therapies, which, again, were experimental. But they were telling people who they, uh, they had one broad, sweeping general health policy. Take the shot, take the boosters, take the shot, shot, booster, booster. And meanwhile, they never considered or factored in natural immunity. If you brought it up, you were beaten up, you know, publicly. I, the pressure that was brought to bear on me to tell people what they should do was uh, unrelenting. And I'm not a doctor. I don't know people's medical histories, pre-existing conditions, comorbidities. I'm not qualified, so I didn't tell them what to do. I said, talk to your doctor, make an informed decision, take it seriously. But you think the whole thing was that bad that well, what? I, well, here's what, you know, I, we've had the WHO, CDC, um, the DHS, and all of the three-letter agencies have worked, have thought about pandemics for 100 years. And they've worked very, very carefully on pandemic preparedness protocols. And all of those protocols said you never lock down a population. What they were doing violated all of the orthodoxies. In fact, the, probably the, the greatest expert on how to handle pandemics in history was a scientist, an American scientist called D.A. Henderson, who's credited with obliterating the smallpox, smallpox, the smallpox disappeared from the world right. by, you know, by when I was a kid. He's the guy who's credited with doing it. And when the, uh, when the public health agencies started saying, we're going to do mass lockdowns, he came out of retirement and published a series of papers saying, you never do that. You're always going to cause more, first of all, you cannot stop a respiratory virus with lockdowns. You're going to actually amplify it because they spread indoors. Well, you're locking people there indoors. Were, there and, were states that didn't lock down. Right, it's the word, right. right. So, um, what did you say? There were states that did not lock down. There were down. states that locked down less. And there are side-by-side -side studies, for example, in Minnesota and Wisconsin. South and Dakota the, never shut down. Right. Schools in Florida opened in August of 2020. Yeah, and I mean, in-person learning. And what all the orthodox protocols said is that you quarantine the sick, you protect the vulnerable, and that you let the population continue because when you shut down businesses, that kills people. You, unemployment kills people. It kills people. <laughs> this is, what you're saying is very true. Yeah. People would call my radio show. My business was shut down. And I'm, I'm a restaurant owner. I can't afford to right. keep my, my doors open any longer. Well, 41% of black-owned businesses in this country 
close down will, that close down will never reopen. And I was in Cleveland uh, two weeks ago in you know one of the poorest neighborhoods in Cleveland, which is called Lee Harvard, and it used to be a booming neighborhood. And you know, I went there with Dennis Kucinich, who's managing my campaign, was mayor of the city, and he was like, "I can't believe, believe what I'm looking at. All of these stores are just shut down." The, um, the, the, we met with a group of black-owned business uh, owners who were the last surviving ones in that, in that district. They're now all shutting down because the hike in interest rates that is caused by, you know, the $16 trillion, the the, all the money we had to print to pay for the lockdowns. Okay, but all, because we only have a one-hour show, and I really, I, I really want to get to the meat, meat of... No, I'm, I'm not uh, trying to interrupt you, I promise. I want to know this, then. In retrospect... What would you have done differently and when? At what point? In other words, would you have allowed the experimental vaccine to be produced? Would it be only for older people? Would you have had mask mandates? Would you have any school shutdowns? You know, do, and if you took those policies on, do you not run the risk if there's more human contact, a virus we didn't know a lot about early on? We still don't really even know enough as far as I'm concerned. What would you have done differently? I, I, I would have done everything differently. I mean, number one, the first thing specific. They, for the first thing that they should have done is to use the, you know, they use the internet in many, many ways, usually to censor doctors and physicians who are trying to say, hey, you know, I'm using a treatment, a protocol that actually works. I'm using therapeutics that work. Those people are silenced. We should have done the opposite. We should have used the internet, that we now have this extraordinary resource to link ourselves to the 15 million frontline physicians around the world and have them report what treatments were they using, what was what working. We know now there were dozens and dozens of therapeutic drugs that were off-the-shelf drugs that obliterated. Are you talking about HCQ? Are you talking I, about ivermectin? Ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, but femtidivir, many, many, many others. And then I think there's a list. Yeah. I think I think uh, I've seen a list that Peter Corey and, and Dr. McCulloch uh, have Peter published. Oh, a, I've been uh, Peter many McCulloch times. Yeah. Of about of about 20 different drugs that were just devastatingly effective against those. But the the problem was not only did they not focus on those, but they tried to prevent the public from getting access to them. And the reason for that was because there's a little known federal law that says you cannot give an emergency use authorization to a vaccine if an existing therapeutic drug that has been approved for any purpose proves to be effective against the target disease. So if they had admitted that hydroxychloroquine, which they knew from day one, that it worked against uh, against COVID, they well, could they not, it would have killed their Ford, 88 Henry billion Ford dollars. Hospital, what? after the fact, came out and said that taken early, it mitigated symptoms. That's what I took out of that. And there were other studies that followed. I never saw one on ivermectin that showed it was effective. However, monoclonal antibodies seemed to be a, a therapeutic that worked very well, but that was also experimental. Well, the, the thing is, you don't know about those studies because the press is not reporting them. But you go to Merrill Nass's website, Dr. Merrill Nass, who's next. Right. Who's an expert in bioterrorism, or Harvey Ridge, who's one of the leading, world's leading epidemiologists at Yale, and they have lists of 199 studies that show that ivermectin is, is on average about 85 percent effective against uh, against serious disease and death, and four 400 studies that show the same about hydroxychloroquine. Well, yeah. I, I got a break. We'll come back. More of our t exclusive town hall. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. for the hour. By the way, programming note, live shows, audience shows, tomorrow, Thursday night, right in New York City. Just go to Hannity.com. Your tickets are free. Things are just getting started. You all having a good time, New York? You having fun? All right. We'll continue. Straight ahead. Thousands of people in here. I can't believe you all came. Thank you all for coming. Welcome back to Hannity. We continue now with Democratic presidential candidate Robert Kennedy Jr. I want to go back, and this drives me nuts, because I've been making the case that our current president, I don't think he knows today's Tuesday. 
He could not sit with me as you are and have this conversation, in my view. I think he is physically weak and cognitively a mess. And nobody wants to say it except a few of us. I want you to look at this tape and tell me if you think he's fit for the job. Take a look. Let's go late and lick the world. For Muslim, for, we cheer for Muslim athletes like Kareem al and, and and Joan, Shingang, I'm going to pass by, Shanga Kowawa. Ban on transgender Americans, transgender Americans. Mr. President, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very oh, much. It's great it. to have you. It's thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Don't go anywhere. It's a very exciting day around here. Um, we'll have reaction. I met alone with him, just he and I, and a simultaneous interpreter 68 times, 68 hours, 68 times, more than 68 hours. All right. God save the queen, man. Thank you very much, Mr. President. We really appreciate it, and we love you. Thank you. I might add, if I didn't, I'd be sleeping alone. <laughs> you have to explain. I better explain that. Some don't know what I'm talking about. My wife's a Philly girl. All right, where are we going? Well, we're going to win, and we're going to help. We have plans to build a railroad from the Pacific all the way across the Indian Ocean. By the way, I met with uh, who are those guys that fly over shortly. You heard of them, haven't you? Okay. Do you believe that he is physically, mentally, cognitively strong enough to lead our country? This world is a dangerous place. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., uh, Robert Kennedy Jr., you know that this is a dangerous place. Is he cognitively strong enough to be your president? Well, he's never been very good with words. <laughs> you know, all right, you get an A-plus for that answer. Is he, is he up to the job? I, how, first of all, let me ask, how many of you here think he is not up to the job? Let me hear. Now, I, I know that there's a reluctance for, for politicians, and you're, you're, you're a Democratic Party guy. You said that at the censorship hearing where they censored you. Um, <laughs> And you've devoted your life to things you believe in, and it's probably hard for you to say that, but do you really think he's up to the job? No, but I, I wouldn't, I'm not reluctant to say that for partisan reasons, Sean. No, okay. I, what I've tried to do during this campaign is avoid personal attacks on people. Uh, but I, I, I will say, I will say whether he's up to it or not, whether he's making his own decisions, the decisions that are coming out of the White House are bad decisions. Right. And, you know, they, uh, I mean, the Democratic Party does not censor people, in my experience. Um, we're not the party of war. We're not the party of the neocons dictating foreign policy. We're the party of the middle class, and we're the party of working people. And that's not where the party is anymore. I, will, I would tell you... Here would be my agenda, and I think you agree on some of these things. I want to secure our borders. I believe every American has the right to be safe and secure in their town, in their city. That means we have to have law and order. It's a prerequisite to pursue happiness. I want an economy that is thriving, an opportunity economy, where everybody, regardless of where you start in life, can climb that ladder to success. I want a mean, tough, kick-ass, killer military that would serve as a deterrent to any hostile regime that might have ill intentions towards us. Uh, I believe in peace through strength with all my heart, control our borders, all these things. They're simple. I believe that educational school choice, we agree on these things? Yeah, we agree on all those things. Yeah. One area... I don't like the fact that America is bearing the brunt and the burden of financing most of the war against Putin in Ukraine. I think we agree on that part. Why isn't Europe, why don't they ever step up and defend their own continent before they ask for U.S. involvement? And why would Joe Biden veto Poland giving Zelensky fighter jets to actually fight to win the war after they were invaded? Well, the more disturbing thing is that uh, on two occasions, the Russians tried to sign a peace agreement 
with Zelensky. Do you trust Putin? Do I trust Putin? No, but that's not, I don't, listen, I, so I, I've uh, litigated over 500 lawsuits. All of them end up with, or many of them end up with settlements or one or the other. And he never trusts the guy on the other side. Uh, you use language art, and you use the design of agreement. So Ukraine, to, to appease Putin, uh, Putin rather, who I think is evil, they've already given up Crimea, it was annexed, so what, they, now they have to give up the Donbass area? Well, I, you know, the, the Ukraine, because of our pushing the Ukraine into the war, on two occasions, they, they, uh, in we, we pushed them into it, or did Putin well, let me tell you. Let me, let me answer your question. Yeah. In 2019, France, Germany, and Russia all agreed to the Minsk Accords. That year, Zelensky ran for president. He was a comedian. He had no political experience. Why did he win? Because he, he won, ran on one issue, signing the Minsk Accords. As soon as he got in there, Victoria Nuland and the White House told him he couldn't do it. Then Putin sends 40,000 troops in. That's not enough to conquer the country. Clearly, he wanted us to come to the negotiation. He wanted somebody to come to a negotiating table. Zelensky came to the negotiating table, signed a new agreement that was the Minsk Accords II in 2022, and that would have allowed Donbass to stay, and Lugansk, to stay to remain as part of, of Ukraine. We said Putin signed it, Zelensky initialed it, and Putin, in good faith, began withdrawing troops from the Ukraine. What happened, we sent Boris Johnson over there to torpedo it, because we don't want peace with, we want the war with Russia. What ha what, what have it, why are you blaming America's role in this? And, and uh, look, I, I am, Putin to me is an evil, murdering dictator thug, and when he leaves this earth, nobody's gonna miss him, let's be honest. Um, however, I think that Europe has a responsibility to protect their continent, and yet it always seems to fall in the United States. Joe Biden has committed all these t billions of dollars that we can't afford, and he's not fighting the war to win the war. I don't believe in fighting wars half-assed. If you're going to fight a war, you go in, overwhelming force, you beat them, you get the hell out. That's it, and only if it's provoked. Putin did not need to invade in, in a sovereign country, in my view. Is Zelensky perfect? Nope. I don't think he is either. I agree with you on that part. But America's role, I think, should be dictated first by Europe. And they've got to defend their continent. And they haven't stepped up, in my view. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think most of the European countries wanted the war either. The, we, it's clear what happened, which is that, you know, from the beginning, we promised in 1992 the Russian leadership said, we will move, this was, was Gorbachev, said when, when the Soviet Union, he was getting ready to dismantle the Soviet Union, and he said, we're going to allow you, we're going to withdraw 400,000 troops from, from East Germany, and we're going to allow you to reunite Germany under NATO, which is a hostile army. That's a huge concession for them. The one commitment that we want, is what the Russians said, is that you will not move NATO to the east. James Baker, who was then Secretary of State under Bush, famously promised, we will not move NATO one inch to the east. Well, since then, we've moved it 1,000 miles in 14 countries. Now, when we started that plan in 1997, Bill Perry, who was the Secretary of Defense under Clinton, said to the Clinton administration, if you move NATO to the east, I'm resigning because you are forcing the Russians to come to war with us. George Kennan was the most important diplomat in American history, the architect of the containment policy during World War II, said the same thing. You do not need to make an, a, 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 an enemy out of Russia. Russia should be treated the way we won the Cold it gets, War. It gets complex. Let me ask you a question. China has been showing nothing but hostility. COVID, uh, intellectual property theft, uh, unfair trade practices. They've been confronting our Navy ships uh, in international waterways. They've been confronting our fighter jets in international airways. They had the spy drone go th fly all around the country. No, Joe didn't shoot it down. Uh, they threatened to shoot hypersonic missiles at the U.S. They're threatening to take out Taiwan and take over Taiwan. They call it reunification. Uh, if you're president, would you come to the defense of Taiwan, our ally? Well, no, no, president, no presidential candidate with any prudence would answer that question. Our, 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 uh, 
our, our policy, our policy towards Taiwan is strategic ambiguity, and that makes a lot of sense. You don't want to project your enemy what you're going to do in, in a certain case, or embolden your friends to go to war thinking that you're going to support them. So that's been our policy, and it's a sensible Do you see policy. China as our top geopolitical foe? They're also trying yes. to undermine the U.S. dollar. Yes. You do? Yeah, and, and that's what, why, that is one, that's another reason why the war in Ukraine is insane, because we have pushed China into the strategic... Donald Trump said he could resolve the issue. Could you, do you think you can create a peace agreement between Ukraine and Russia? I think we have to, there's no joint, Russia's not going to lose this war. Russia can't afford this, would be like us losing a war to Mexico. They're not, they are not going to lose the war. Go look at what Russia did in Stalingrad in order to preserve its, its territorial integrity. Russia's been invaded three times through the Ukraine. Russia's been invaded three times through the Ukraine. The last time, Hitler killed one out of every seven Russians. They're 400 miles from Moscow. We already have Aegis missile systems within 12 minutes of Moscow. We wouldn't tolerate that if the Russians did it in 1962 when they put them in, in Cuba. Cuba. My uncle was going to invade if they... If they I if want they to talk go. a little bit about your background growing up, your uncle as president, uh, what happened to him, what happened to your dad, he was the attorney general, uh, and what you think about how, what, how those things happened. More with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. as Hannity continues. Please stay with us. in New York City, our exclusive town hall with Democratic presidential primary candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who shocked many Biden loyalists recently with stronger than expected poll numbers. Your poll numbers have been very solid, strong, hovering around 20 percent. Um, look, I know you've addressed it. I, I don't want to belabor it, but I do want to bring it up because I, I, I think there's still some ambiguity on it. And this was the comment on tape. There, there is a tape of it. I can play it if you want that there's an argument that COVID was ethnic, uh, ethnically targeting uh, certain races disproportionately, uh, targeting, for example, Caucasian and black people, and the people who are most immune are Ashkenazi Jews and Chinese. And then you said at another point that that's not what you were saying. Was it just misunderstood? I mean, I don't like people that race to say that somebody is anti-Semitic or racist when in fact it, I just want to give yeah, you a chance to uh, clarify it. I was, I, I was um, describing an NIH-funded study. First of all, it's not surprising that a disease uh, uh, would target, would have uh, a disproportionate impact on certain races. Well, many diseases do. And is it, this is a, and I was descri describing a 2021 study that was funded by NIH that was performed by a half a dozen at least scientists, three, the three lead scientists from Cleveland Clinic. And that study showed that the, the docking site for the, uh, on the fur and cleave of the, of the uh, COVID virus was particularly compatible with certain races. And it doesn't mean that those races disproportionately died, but chiefly with, African, with people of African descent, Right. Next of Caucasians, least of all people from Finland, and uh, and uh, people and and certain German Germanic races, and then ethnic Chinese were were also the uh, le least uh, or less susceptible, and Ashkenazi Jews. All right, there is no little... suggestion ever that somebody designed it to be that way, that it was designed to preserve certain races. I was not suggesting that. So let me ask you about your life. I look at your life. Your uncle is the president of the United States, Camelot. We all know so much about the presidency of your uncle, the short presidency of your uncle, and your father, the attorney general at the time. Uh, and then your father makes a run for president. And like his brother, he was assassinated. You have suggested that you believe there was a conspiracy, 
within our government, intelligence agencies, more specifically, you mentioned the CIA, and that you even believe yourself today, because of your last name, I'm assuming, that your life could be in jeopardy. Why do you believe that they were involved in the assassination of both your, your dad and your uncle, and maybe that you may be a target? Well, I haven't said that I may be a target. I mean, people have asked me if I, I mean, there's always for anybody who runs for president. Anybody who's on, on Fox is a target, but yeah, go ahead. So, you know, I, mean, I, I think I've taken a lot worse risks in my life than running for president. So I, I I'm, I, but it's, but, but it's also got to be hard. You lost your uncle, you lost your father. I mean, that's horrible. Yeah, but what are you saying? Are you... No, so why do you think that our government could be involved in... Oh, well, you evidence? know, listen, when the Warren Commission, obviously, which was run by Alan Dulles, who was the head of the CIA, who my uncle fired, found that it was a lone shooter, which was Leah Harvey Oswald. But when Congress, a congressional committee reinvestigated between 1977 and 1979 the House Select Assassinations Committee, they concluded, and, and they saw a lot more documentation and had a lot more witnesses than the Warren Commission ever saw, they concluded that my uncle was killed by a, a conspiracy. And the, most of the people, for example, Richard Schweitzer, who was the first the head of the committee, publicly said, uh, JFK, John, the President of the United States, was, that the CIA was involved in the murder of the President of the United States. And that's a quotation. Most of the people on that committee at that time believed it was the CIA, that it was believed certain pe people in the CIA. You were, you were seven at the time? Seven or eight? I was, uh, I was 10 when my uncle was ten killed. I was 14 when my father was killed. Oh, so, um, you know, the, and today there is overwhelming evidence. I mean, in fact, Why don't the, it was, it was just, needs to you know, release the, all of the files on it and let it let be transparent. Let us see the information. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. There's still, you know, the, the law requires, there, you know, there's a law that requires that all the records of John Kennedy's assassination be released to the public 10 years ago. So they're still holding 5,000 documents. President Biden promised when he was elected that he was going to release those documents. President Trump promised that he would. But the CIA doesn't want them to. And so the question that I think Americans have a right to ask, including members of, you know, my father and uncle's family, is why not? What is it that you don't want to see 60 years later? And by the way, the last... You know, the last... The last, tran the last tranche of documents released um, had documentation in there that finally got even the New York Times to admit that Lee Harvey Oswald was a CIA asset, that he was working for the CIA. So, um, and America, if the Warren Commission had known that back in, in you know, 1964, they would have had a very different time. And the House Assassinations Committee never knew that. Mm -hmm. That was released, um, you know, we've known that, that we've had documentation, that known that at least a decade. But some of that documentation became overwhelming in this last tranche, and finally the mainstream media acknowledged that, yeah, he had this relationship with the CIA going back to 1957 or 1958. We, we have a, a minute left in, in this hour, and I want to ask you this. You, you, you're talking to the American people tonight. Why should they vote for you for president? Tell them, what, what, make I mean, in a one-minute final statement. Uh, I mean, the, you know, I'm running on a, um, on a I'm, I think most Americans, we're at our, each other's throats today. We have the worst polarization that we've ever had since the American Civil War. It's more dangerous and more toxic. Well, the 60s was a little crazy, too. I the mean, 60s were, yeah, when my father ran, it was, you know, there was a lot of uh, division at that time. But it's hard to say, see how this is ever going to end well. And what I've said is I want to end that polarization, and I want to do that by telling the truth. <laughs> no, and that, that, that the way that we're going to do that, the first step we have to take is, is to tell the truth. Have somebody, have a president who's willing to tell the truth about everything. People... 
people in this country know that the system is rigged, and they know that they're being lied to. And you, we need- you look at Donald Trump and all, like for, look, look at, for example, the way Hillary Clinton, top secret classified information, no, no prosecutor would ever prosecute, no raid at Chappaqua. You got four locations Joe Biden has, top secret classified information, they didn't raid his home. Donald Trump, they raid Mar-a-Lago. And then the question is, in the 2020 election, for example, the FBI had Hunter's laptop in December of 2019. They verified its authenticity in March of 2020. Why was the FBI in the months leading up to that election meeting with big tech companies and telling big tech companies that uh, they may be victims of misinformation campaigns and it may be about Joe or Hunter Biden when they knew damn well they'd already authenticated it and and what's interesting is the head of site integrity for Twitter at the time, Yoel Roth, actually testified in a, in a Missouri case that, in fact, they, that they said it might be about Hunter. And then none of these big tech companies allowed anybody to read the laptop story in the weeks leading up to that election. Now, to me, that is our government, in this case through the FBI, putting center blocks on a scale of an election. Is that something you would stop and do you agree with me? Yeah, I would stop that. In fact, I'm going to issue an executive order the moment I get into the White House the first day forbidding ending the weaponization of our agencies for political purposes. um, It's it's worse than it's ever been. In my my view, it's worse than it's ever been. And you know, one party will be in power, and, and then they'll start doing it to the other party, and it's going to be back and forth. Of course, yeah. of course. And this, you know, Judge Doty's decision, which I'm, my name is, you know, occurs on many, many, many pages. That because I was the first person censored by the Biden White House, the Biden, Biden administration. Uh, President Biden took the oath of office on January 21st, 2021, and the White House ordered Twitter to begin censoring me 37 hours later. I was the first name to be censored. And then three weeks after that, my Instagram account, which was my major way of talking to the public, was deplatformed and disappeared. Well, the, and, and, by the way, did you see at the censorship hearing? You got a great line when you said, I'm at a censorship hearing and you're censoring me. I mean, <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Um, When we come back, more of our town hall with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Please stay with us. All right, unfortunately, that is all the time we have left this evening. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., thank you so much for doing this. We appreciate it. Good to see you. Thanks to everyone who participated in tonight's town hall. We have in-studio shows tomorrow and Thursday night. Sign up at Hannity.com. Tickets are absolutely free. Please say your DVR so you never, ever, ever, ever miss an episode of Hannity. In the meantime, let not your heart be troubled. Greg Gutfeld standing by to put a smile on your face and take you to bed. Have a great night.